Hello there. Welcome to our service where we're looking at Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. We're going to think about anticipating a saviour. I was reading recently about driving automaticity, a fancy word for the behaviour where sometimes when you're driving a route that you know very well, you get to your destination and you realise that you're not really conscious of much of the journey. You must have manoeuvred, braked, changed lanes, done everything safely, but you don't really remember it. Your familiarity means that you, you drive on autopilot without realising it. Sometimes we can read the Bible on autopilot too if we're not careful. We're, we're continuing our journey through Luke's Gospel. It's a well-trodden path with passages that have become very familiar to us over the years. Sometimes these passages become so familiar that like automatic driving, we can skate over them without paying quite so much attention. In this short passage, we find the angel Gabriel's second visit to Earth, about six months after the first one that we read about last week. Six months earlier, Gabriel had come to visit a godly old priest in Jerusalem, in the very temple itself. Righteous in the sight of God, obeying all the Lord's commands and decrees without blame, the only sad thing in their life was that they had no child. I imagine they must have prayed much about that over the years. So Gabriel has visited a saintly, respected man in the centre of the temple, the centre of Jerusalem, the centre of the kingdom. That's pretty important, eh? Who does he visit this time round? Gabriel is sent to Nazareth, a poorly regarded, poor village, far to the north of Jerusalem, a peasant backwater in a peasant province, as far from the importance of the temple as you could get. And who is Gabriel sent to? Not to a priest. It's worth knowing that in those days, a common prayer of devout Jewish men was, thank you for not making me a Gentile, a slave or a woman, because women were so poorly regarded. Yet Gabriel is sent to an unmarried woman, a virgin, almost certainly a teenager. A person of more lowly status, it would have been hard to find. And yet here the angel was. Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you, he announced. <laughs> no wonder Mary is perplexed at this. And as we look through this passage, I'd like to think what it tells us about Jesus, what it tells us about Mary, and perhaps a little bit that it might tell us about us. So let's carry on. First of all, we're going to think about Jesus being announced. Mary was greatly troubled and wondered what kind of a greeting this was. Being called highly favoured when you're a simple peasant girl looking forward to getting married to a working carpenter seems, well, out of place. And to be told that the Lord is with her? But Gabriel then drops a real bombshell. He says, you will conceive and give birth to a son. And you are to call him Jesus. And what else do we learn about this son whom she is to bear? He will be great. He will be called the son of the Most High. He will be given the throne of David, his forefather. He will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. The Son of God, who will sit on the throne of David, who will reign forever? This is no less than the promised Messiah of 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 16, of Psalm 89 verses 3 and 4, of Isaiah 9 verse 7, of Jeremiah 33 verse 17, of Daniel chapter 2 verse 44, or Daniel 7 verse 14, or Micah chapter 4 verse 7. The Old Testament was full of prophecies speaking of the Messiah who had come, the Son of God who would sit on the throne of David. The angel is sent to announce to a nobody in a backwater that the promise of the ages, the one in whom all Israelite history and prophecy has been pointing is going to be born here 
in Nazareth to this unmarried girl? How does Mary respond? Well, Mary is amazed. Mary knows that she's a virgin. She knows that she's never had sexual relations with a man, not even Joseph, to whom she's betrothed, because she's not yet married to him. And that's why her question in verse 34 is one of puzzlement. Uh, how will this be? This is in contrast to the faithless request for a sign that Zechariah asked for, which we considered last week. She understands the angel's statement, but she doesn't understand how, well, the, the mechanics are going to work. Gabriel explains that no man is going to be involved here. In some mysterious way, the Holy Spirit and the power of God are going to cause you to become pregnant, he says. We then see the proof that her question was one of puzzlement and not disbelief, because after hearing this frankly unprecedented statement, um, she responds in verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Do those sound like brave words? Because they should do. It's easy for us to underestimate what she was letting herself in for, but she must have known. Sex outside marriage, whether adultery or fornication, was punishable by death, by stoning. A man might get away with it, but for a woman, the pregnancy would be obvious. She was putting her life very much at risk. And even if she were not stoned, what, what would it do to her betrothal to Joseph and her whole future? How would she raise a child without a husband to protect and care for them? She was highly favoured by God, not because of her privileged position, not because of her training, not because of her ambition, but perhaps because God knew that when he asked her how much she would be prepared to sacrifice for him, she effectively said, everything. We read in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 19 that Joseph was faithful to the law, but he didn't want to expose her to public disgrace, so he thought it was best to, to divorce her quietly and not make a big thing about it. However, an angel visits him in a dream and explains that this is all of God and that he should take Mary as his wife, and this Joseph obediently does. People in the village have eyes, and they can count months. And no doubt tongues wagged as they saw Mary's pregnancy develop. No doubt he shared some of the shaming looks as people drew their own conclusions about the carpenter and his wife. Following God's directions isn't necessarily a route of comfort and glory, and it certainly wasn't for Mary and Joseph. What about us? I think we are invited to listen here. I mentioned at the start of the experience of driving on autopilot and how sometimes we read the Bible on autopilot. I bet you probably also had the experience when a phrase in the Bible jumps out at you. Uh, you notice something the way you've not noticed it before, no matter how many times you may have read it. The Bible can be powerful and God loves to speak to us through it. I read the following story in The Bible in One Year by Nicky Gumbel. Fyodor was a wild young man. His life revolved around eating, drinking, talking, music, theatre and the company of women. He dreamt of fame. He was caught up in a movement for political and social reform during the repressive reign of Tsar Nicholas I. He was arrested, tried and condemned to be shot. On a bitterly cold morning in Russia, the prisoners were taken out to be shot. The prison guards raised their muskets to their shoulders and took aim. And at the last moment, a white flag was raised, raised to announce that the Tsar had commuted their sentence to life imprisonment in Siberia. On his arrival in Siberia on Christmas Eve 1849, at the age of 28, two women slipped him a New Testament. When the guard turned away momentarily, they suggested he should search the pages thoroughly. And he did. While in prison, Fyodor Dostoevsky, 
the great Russian novelist, read the New Testament from cover to cover and learnt much of it by heart. He wrote, I believe that there is no one lovelier, deeper, more sympathetic and more perfect than Jesus. I say to myself with jealous love, not only is there no one else like him, but there could never be anyone like him. It was through the Bible that he had encountered Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul describes all scripture as God breathed in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. The Bible is not just inspired in the way that artists, poets, composers and musical performers are said to be inspired. It actually has God's breath, God's spirit in it. The Bible is one of the main ways that God speaks to us. So as we look at Mary at this pivotal moment in history, what strikes you most about her? I'm struck that God decided to give such an important task to someone who is unexpected, unremarkable, untrained. I'm also struck that in accepting what God had put before her, she was also accepting all the risks that went along with it too, that the task would be difficult, dangerous, sometimes perplexing. And I think that while Mary was a unique person at a unique point in history, she is also a model for us to consider. How often do we think that God doesn't have any special purpose for us because we are too unremarkable, too untrained, too young? Yet God speaks to us regularly, not typically through the visitations of angels, but as we prayerfully read the Bible, God speaks to us. And I want to encourage you this Christmas as you sing familiar carols and read familiar Bible passages to listen out for God's voice and to be imitators of Mary who said, yes, Lord. May God bless you this Christmas time. Thank you.